I want to talk about my favorite subject. That is Bible prophecy. I see a lot of things happening in the world that reminds us of the vivid details of what's coming on the face of the earth for those of us who are Bible Christians. And we know that having read Matthew 24, 25, and the book of Revelation and many other verses in the Bible that have given us insight as to what's coming in the future, it's easy to see this global pandemic that we're all facing right now and living through as sort of a prelude to what's to come. And I think it is a prelude of a kind of thing that is to come, although I don't think it's anywhere as bad as what is to come. I know, as a matter of fact, that it isn't. However, there is so much confusion, and it is so hurtful to me to see people posting how they are trying to get ready for this great tribulation that the church is going to go through, they think, and talking about they're not going to take a vaccine for this virus because it's going to have the mark of the beast in it, and they're going to make you take a chip, and they're going to do all these things. And as I see these people explaining their fears and how they're actually tying this stuff into biblical prophecy, it just gives me an incentive to try to chime in a little bit and see if I can bring some experience to this table after 40 years plus of teaching on this subject and studying it even now uh, on almost a weekly basis. I think I could say a few things that might clear some things up, especially some confusion. And I don't want to address, or I should say, I don't have the time to address this in any broad sense, but I want to just chip away at it by chiming in a little bit at a time. And in this case, I want to chime in with defining the term the Great Tribulation and just give you some thoughts about that. Now, I wrote this in an article on Facebook, and so you can read this if you're more of a reader than a listener. But I'm putting this forth in a video to make it audibly available for those who are not so much into reading long articles and who much more enjoy just listening to someone explain themselves. So let's look at this term, the Great Tribulations. Christians are confused over this term, the Great Tribulation, simply because they mix up two things. They mix up the natural Israel with the church, and this presents a real problem because they don't see their Bible in the way that it's meant to be seen, and that is, it is an Old and a New Testament, and the New Testament is mostly about the church, but not completely about the church. Part of the New Testament is futuristic, and it's about when God turns his self back to the nation of Israel and then completes all the promises that he's made to them throughout the bulk of the Old Testament. And so what happens is is there's a lot of confusion literally mixing things that are for Israel to the church and things for the church to Israel and not seeing the difference. And so that's what causes much of the confusion. They also mix up the word tribulation, and this is becoming problematic because we know that the word tribulation could be a verb or it can be a noun. And so whenever they mix up the word tribulation when it's used as a verb, uh, they mix that up with the term great tribulation, which is speaking of a period of time and or of an age, and that is a noun, it is not a verb. To clear this up, it is best to quit using the term tribulation to refer to the time of the end when God's judgment is coming upon the face of the earth, as is outlined in the book of Revelation after chapter 4, let's say, to chapter 19. And rather, we should refer to this time to one term, and that term would be the time of Jacob's trouble, because this would help us as church people in the church age before God turns back to Israel to keep clear what we're talking about. So if we always refer to what we 
have commonly referred to as the Great Tribulation Period or the Tribulation Period, and we stop using that term and we turn to this specific term that is more acutely uh, defined for what it is, and that is it's a time of Jacob's slash Israel's trouble, then we can really truly keep things straight and stop confusing terms that are in the Bible. Here's the scripture that defines this term, and I want to show you that it's a biblical uh, definition. Jeremiah 30 and 7 is the key verse. It's actually the context is from verse 5 through 9, and I'm going to read that entirely for you. But before we do, let's read the key verse, and that's verse 7. And here's what it says. Uh, Alas, for that day is great, hence we get the term great tribulation, so that none is like it. And it is the time, hence it isn't a verb, it is a noun. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he, that is Jacob or Israel, shall be saved out of it. Now here's this verse in its context. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 5 through 9. I'm reading this one out of the New King James Version. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? And all faces turned pale. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he, that is Jacob slash Israel, shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them. Now that's a little confusing in the King James Version. So I want to tell you what it's saying. In that verse there, it says that in that day, during this period of time, that God, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, is going to break the foreigner's yoke. That's what he means by his. The foreigner's yoke, that's Gentiles, from your, Jacob, Israel's neck, and will burst your Bonds means will burst the handcuffs on your legs and on your arms. I am going to set you free and you will never be enslaved by the Gentiles or foreigners or in their land again. That's what he's saying. And then verse 9 says, but they shall serve, this is Israel, shall serve the Lord their God and David their king whom I will raise up for them. Now, here's what you got to notice here is this is the time of Jacob's trouble. It is not the time of the church's trouble. It has specifically stated that it has to do with the Gentiles who are enslaving a people called Israel or a nation called Israel, and it is promising to break their yoke. There is no way whatsoever that you could make this about the Gentile church in any way, shape, or form, not spiritually, not analogously, not in any way can it pertain to the Christian Gentile church. So here's my point. When misguided Christians suggest that the church is going to have to endure this period of time, saying that the church is going to have to go through the tribulation period, because of using it in that way and using those terms, it may sound reasonable because you know that you have other scriptures in the Bible that promise that the church will indeed suffer tribulation. But what is not noticed is those verses are using the word tribulation as a verb and not a noun. So making one small change makes it much clearer by changing the term to a specific term like Jacob's trouble so that you're going to be able to sound very clear about what time or what age you're talking about. If you don't do this and you start just using that term in a generic way when it was meant to be a verb and not a noun, 
you are going to sound very uninformed from a theological point of view if you're found declaring on Facebook or other places that you, as a member of the church, are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. See, it doesn't make sense if you use the term Jacob's trouble. It only makes sense if you say to somebody, I think the church is going to go through the Great Tribulation. No one blinks at that. But if you say, I think the church is going to th go through the foretold time of great trouble destined for Israel and Jacob, then you've got this problem because you don't even seem to be making sense out of what you're saying. So I want to suggest that in order to make the actual term clear, that we always use this term, Jacob's trouble, instead of, quote unquote, the great tribulation or tribulation. The time of Jacob's trouble has nothing to do with the church. The church would only merit or need such a time of judgment if it was as backslidden and as bad off as Jacob or Israel. I assume that you know that Jacob was the name of the man who was the father of all of the tribes of Israel before God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. I want to make sure that you understand that. In this case, you may think right now that the church is in such bad shape that it needs this kind of judgment to go through. And unfortunately, if that's what your take is, this would show that you have further confusion because God has never worked with the church in bulk like this as he has and will do with Israel, a nation entirely outside of his salvation currently. You must understand that any Jew that is in a state of salvation today is in the church and is not a part of the future remnant of Jews prophesied to be saved during the time of Jacob's trouble. There are no natural Israel persons that are of the faith who would at the same time be outside of the church. When a Jew sees the light of Christ, he or she is immediately added to the church. At salvation, they are both natural Jews. And now, because God saved them and brought them into the church, they are spiritual Jews also. But their inheritance was just upgraded from inheriting mere land and a kingdom of Israel to inheriting God's throne, which now would be their place with the rest of the church. You might say, well, the church is in bad shape today, so she deserves the judgment of God too. God's true church may or may not be in good shape spiritually today. I think that you can have it both ways. I would say there's plenty of people who are in great shape spiritually, and there's plenty of people who are not. It just depends on each individual in the church. However, this is exactly what the state of the living church has been in throughout the church age. Each individual in the church for the last 2,000 years has had to go through a, quote, disciplinary process, end of quote, administered by the Holy Spirit with the aim to bring each believer to the maturity and sanctification of holiness within the boundaries of their own lifetime. Each age or generation has come and went with God's excellent ability to do this work as promised to every Christian generation. Philippians 1, 6 says, And I am certain, Paul writes, that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You see, that's how God disciplines the church. That's how he works the church. And he doesn't need a special effort called Jacob's trouble in order to make the last generation of Christians go through a special process that they need and the rest of the 2,000 years of church history didn't need. That God would need to add judgment to his work of discipline in order that the church would be made ready for the second coming and the millennial kingdom makes no sense whatsoever. He would then need to resurrect every generation of previous church Christians and put them through the time of Jacob's troubles so that they could prove themselves through it with us. Does this make any sense? It does not. The glorious truth of the gospel is that Christ took God's judgment on the cross for us so that we could be saved from any and all God's future judgments. What the Christian is subject to is loving discipline and not judgment.
The time of Jacob's trouble is God's judgment on the world. And at the same time, he delivers Jacob or Israel from that judgment. And he saves them, turning their hearts back to him and to their Messiah, Jesus Christ. On the other hand, if you insist that somehow the church is sovereignly destined to Jacob's trouble, you're going to have a heck of a time making sense saying that it is the church that is destined to go through it. This would be like as if you had a son and a daughter and you told your son, you know what, you are in big trouble because we just found out your sister didn't clean her room. Now you, my son, are going to pay for your sister's disobedience. Is this not a ludicrous function of thought this is not logical remember god's judgment of the whole world is coming during the time of jacob's trouble that's an era that's a period of time that is a noun but it's not judgment for jacob it's discipline for jacob but it's judgment for the world they that is the world will be mostly destroyed during this time of judgment because they are the targets of this judgment the world is going to be judged. Jacob's going to be here when and while it's being judged. And it is going to provide a very severe discipline to Jacob, but it's not going to kill Jacob. It's going to kill most of the rest of the world's people. And all the Gentiles of the world who want God to save them and pay attention to what God is saying to them during that time, especially with the Jewish prophets that come to preach during that time, he is going to make a provision so that they can be saved from and within it. Jacob and Israel who believe the two prophets who are coming, I think these two prophets are Elijah and Enoch, and I believe that because Elijah represents the time of the prophets after the law, and Enoch represents the period of time of prophets before the law was given. And also because neither of these two gentlemen have died a natural death yet. And they both are slated to die in the streets of Jerusalem at this time. So if they have never died and they are going to die in the streets of Jerusalem as Revelation says they are, then it would have to be these two if it is them at all. Some people think it's Elijah and Moses because Elijah and Moses appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that would all make sense except for the fact that Moses can't die twice. Uh, at least it doesn't seem to me like he could because he has already died and been buried and that is recorded in Scripture. And so bringing him back and then killing him again makes no sense because that is against what God says. The Bible clearly says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment not twice and so i don't think god's going to make an exception with moses but anyway that's my theology and it doesn't matter who it is it could be two people that are raised up during that time although i doubt it because malachi ends saying elijah's coming and so i really think elijah is the one who's coming but nevertheless we'll leave that there because that doesn't matter but the jews who believe these two prophets are going to be saved alive during the time of Jacob's trouble, and they are going to be provided safe passage throughout the entirety of this ordeal. They are not going to die. They're not going to be destroyed by the Antichrist. God is going to preserve them. But the Gentiles, who are not Jews, who come to faith through God's judgment during that time are mostly going to give their life and be beheaded during that same time frame. And that's why the majority of those who make it into a place of salvation in faith are going to have to give their life. That's going to be a horrible time to be a Christian outside of the church age. It's going to be awful because it is going to cost them their lives. These are not the church. So these Gentiles who are not the church, but are saved during the great tribulation, as is noted in Revelation, they are not raptured or taken to meet Christ in the air whenever the end of the tribulation comes and the Lord returns, but they are simply resurrected at Christ's coming so that they are going to be participants in God's kingdom government that we call the millennial reign of Christ. 
Oh yes, I know that there are those who are deluded into thinking that the church is spiritual Israel, and therefore they have somehow replaced Israel, and whatever was promised to natural Israel now belongs to the church. This is absolutely ridiculous, heretical ideas that are not true. The church is indeed a sort of, or in a certain respect, spiritual Israel, but this certainly does not make her a replacement for natural Israel, nor is it possible that this is true, because it is absolutely contrary to clear, very understandable Pauline teaching on the subject found in Romans chapter 11. All you have to do is read verse 12. Did God's people Israel, I, I'm adding the word Israel here, that's who he's referring to. Did God's people Israel stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not. Just stop there. Has Israel's sins and rejection of God made them beyond recovery? Paul answers the question, no way, Jose. They were disobedient, he says, so God made salvation available to the Gentiles but he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. In other words, come back to him. And verse 12 says, Now if the Gentiles were enriched because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when? When they finally accept it. And when is that? It's about our subject. The time of Jacob's trouble. That's when they're going to finally accept it. That's what that's all about. Romans 11, 25 through 29. I want you to understand this mystery, Paul says. Dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only, listen, only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. See? The church age has an end. It's when the full number of Gentiles come to Christ and then something great happens. Verse 26, and so all Israel, talking about natural Israel, will be saved as the scriptures say, the one, and now he's quoting his, his Old Testament, the one who rescues will come from Jerusalem, talking about Christ, and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them, not us, not the church, with them that I will take away their sins, not our sins. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news, and this benefits you, the church, Gentiles, yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at this. This is declaring that even though none of Israel is serving God and is in a saved condition right now, because if they were, they would be a part of the church. I'm excluding any Jew that gets saved. I'm saying, okay, but there are those mostly that are without the church. None of those are serving the Lord, but God still loves them. He loves them because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the reasoning behind this, Paul tells us in verse 29, for, that means this is why, God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Those who would tell you that the church has replaced Israel says that Israel rejected God so many times that finally he let them reject him for the last time and he turned to us and now we're natural Israel. That is a lie. That is not the truth. And that is going to take you down a road that's going to make you believe other lies that's going to mess you up with your theology. The time of Jacob's trouble is prophesied throughout the Old Testament. The prophet Daniel made it clear that the last of the 70 weeks, a week meaning seven years long, a week of years, was determined upon natural Israel and that it would be the last week or the last seven years that we would be referring to as the time of great tribulation or the 70th week or now what I'm trying to get you to agree to do, and that is just call it Jacob's trouble, the week of Jacob's trouble. So we want to just make the term clear so that people who are in the church can quit saying that they think the church is going to go through Jacob's trouble. The logic of that is so clear that it just makes no sense if you use the correct term.
It is the time of Jacob's trouble, and it is going to fall on Jacob. It's going to fall on Israel because they're the ones who are without faith right now. Probably 90% of Israel don't even believe in God. They're atheists. The natural people, Israel, whom God loves because of his covenant with their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has gathered them back to their land. He is setting them up for a time that is so near where he is going to send them to prophets and he is going to get them to listen and believe the message that those prophets teach and preach. And this is going to save them from the judgment to come on the whole world. And this is why all of the teaching that Jesus did in Matthew 24 and in Luke, I believe, 13, refers to a specific place called Israel, a specific city called Jerusalem, a specific thing called the temple, etc. It has everything to do with natural Israel. It is specifically designed not to save and fold Israel into the church, which would be the only possible way salvation could come to the Jews if the church is still in the world during the time of Jacob's trouble. But it is designed, in fact, to bring all Israel back to God through repentance and recognition and acceptance of their once rejected Messiah. So don't be misled and think that you have an appointment to share in Jacob's trouble. You don't unless you miss the rapture of the church that happens at the point when the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ, as I read to you in Romans eleven twenty-five. I'll say it again. I want you to understand this mystery Paul wrote so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. That's it. That's my message today. It was clear. It was plain. I hope that it helped you to understand that you have the full assurance of salvation to be saved not only from judgment to come like the judgment of hell, but we also are going to escape as Revelation tells us in the first three chapters, telling the church, I am not going to appoint you to the wrath of God. You are not appointed to the wrath and neither is your fellow church members that you go to church with. They are all appointed to escape and it is going to be done by the rapture of the church, which is taught in 1 Corinthians and 1 Thessalonians and the book of John chapter uh, 14. So all of these things make so much sense when you put them into the perspective of the time frames that the Bible is talking about. And you don't confuse the word tribulation with the noun great tribulation. And you don't confuse the messages that are spoken to Israel as being spoken to the church and the messages spoken to the church as being spoken to natural Israel. All of this has to be sorted out and has to be kept clear. So anyway, thank you. God bless you. May the Lord be with you for the rest of your day.